Jesus had been tried by two high priests and found guilty of blasphemy. Now he is being tried civilly, that is, by an official representative of Rome. And Rome, of course, rules the world. He has already, that is, Pilate has already said in verse 38 that was just read for us, I find no fault in him at all. Now that is a, an acquittal. And we're going to talk about four acquittals. He's been pronounced innocent. And you would think that might be the, uh, the conclusion of the matter. But uh, as we know, that is not the conclusion of the matter. Pilate's effort to release Jesus was met with resistance. He offered to release Jesus or another man, Barabbas, who was known to be a thief and a robber, a, reader, uh, a leader of uh, insurrection, and they demanded that he be freed, a murderer, be granted unto them, and uh, decided to destroy the prince of life. So when they were given that choice, they picked Barabbas. So Jesus is still before Pilate. What happens next, however, is hard to fathom. And we want to read about it in John 19, verses 1 through 3. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. It is a fact that many people died from the scourging alone. And yet, Pilate had him scourged, a man that he just said, I found, I find no fault in him at all. So why would he have him scourged? If he found no fault in him, why would he submit Jesus to something that would uh, possibly cause him to die just by undergoing it? Well, we have an uh, answer to that biblically, but not uh, rationally. And the answer biblically is that by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. If uh, you have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, then you have seen how vicious a scourging can be. After watching that for a, a, a few seconds, the viewer just wants to say, Stop! But, of course, the soldier continues. And uh, I don't know precisely how they figured out when to stop beating someone. Uh, it might have been at the soldier's uh, own ideology. It might have been a commander uh, who instructed him, you can stop now. But I'm guessing probably they stopped when it looked like if they had continued much longer, the victim would have died. At this point, however, the soldiers still have no mercy. They twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and then beat it down into his scalp. They put on him a purple robe, usually reserved for royalty, but they were mocking him as they put it upon him. And then, of course, they uh, shouted out, Hail, King of the Jews, because they knew what Jesus had claimed. They knew that, uh, in fact, he had even come to Pilate and said uh, that he came into the world to be a king. 
And then they struck him with their hands. Matthew and Mark add, add that they also spat upon him. They did this even though the soldiers had no vested interest in them. What did they care? He had not done anything to them. He had not uh, despised them, condemned them, said something evil about soldiers. He had done nothing against them, and yet they continue to join in all of the thoughts of the crowd who wanted Jesus to suffer and die. I guess they were caught up in this spirit of contempt for Jesus. But why did Pilate allow the treatment of Jesus as it has been practiced here when he had proclaimed him innocent? Perhaps it was a compromise. He may have been thinking, and we don't, we don't know all of his thought press, uh, processes, obviously, but he may have been thinking that if Jesus were given a severe enough beating, that maybe that would satisfy the crowd. Maybe that would be sufficient. Maybe it would save his life. However, like most compromises, the plan failed. And we notice in verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. And this is the second acquittal. However, that did not end the matter either. So we must read verse 5, which follows. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. The Latin words have become more famous than the Greek words recorded. In the Greek, it would be ide ho anthropos, the Greek word for man. But uh, the Latin version in, uh, is much briefer, eke homo. And you see that phrase used a lot in literature and uh, it uh, seems to be quite common. But we don't really know which language Pilate spoke. Probably he spoke the Latin version, but it's recorded in the Greek. The New Testament is written in Greek. But that aside, you would think that anyone with an ounce of pity in their soul would have looked at Jesus and said, it is enough. You would think that. Jesus had been beaten as severely as a man could possibly be beaten without dying in the process. He is bleeding. He has blood running down in his face and uh, from the crown of thorns, and he stands there in full humiliation, totally mocked for anything that he may have said about being a king. Now, think of someone you do not particularly care for. Maybe somebody who has been continually obnoxious. It may be a neighbor. It may be somebody at work. This person may have even made life miserable for you. Could you see them in such a condition and possibly wish them further harm? I don't know how. But the crowd in front of Jesus did. The leaders of the Jews have no compassion. Their hatred knows no bounds. It is not satisfied. It will not be satisfied until he is crucified and dies. 
and this anger, worst of all, is directed toward God himself. Jesus is God. But as far as they were concerned, humiliation was not enough. Pain and suffering was not enough. Only death would suffice. So we read in verse 6, Therefore when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. So he challenges the Jews. He issues a challenge for them and says, you go ahead and take him. Now this is after the third acquittal. If they take him and kill him without Pilate's permission, they would be in trouble. And they know that. So now they come and... Uh, tell him the real reason why they have brought Jesus to him. Verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. In other words, as far as they are concerned, he has blast, blasphemed in making himself the Son of God. They had not mentioned this before. If you go back to uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 2, here's what they said when they initially brought Jesus before Pilate. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 2, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now they're going to come back to that thought pretty soon. But it did not include him being a blasphemer. Now they clearly say that he is blaspheming because he said I am the son of God Pilate becomes more fearful and that's not hard to understand why why did he become fearful did he believe the Roman theology concerning demigods that gods had offspring and they lived among men did he know the Jewish religion, about a coming Messiah. Had he heard Isaiah 53 and verse 5, for whatever reason, he was the more afraid. And notice what he did next in verse 9. In verse 9, he, said, he went again to the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. He's considering what they said, though, seriously, isn't he? They said that he said he was the Son of God, and Pilate wants to know, Where are you from? Are you indeed a son, the Son of God? To find out if Jesus was the Son of God would have been interesting so far as Pilate was concerned. Was Jesus from heaven? Had God sent him to earth? Jesus had claimed so throughout the Gospel of John. Many times it has been mentioned. It was not kept secret from those who heard Jesus. We don't know everything that Pilate knows, though he may not have heard that. But he asks the question. He wants to know. But now Jesus is silent. He is silent. Why is he silent? Well, what is he going to say? If he answers yes, will 
Pilate then defend him at all costs, thus thwarting God's plan? Or will he ask for proof? Actually, Jesus has already provided plenty of proof which Pilate could have found out quite easily and which Pilate has certainly heard of. Will Pilate try to save Jesus? Or will he tell him, well, if you're from heaven, save yourself? Who knows what would happen as a result of that? But Jesus remains silent. And this aggravates Pilate. Notice verse 10. Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know I have power to crucify you and power to release you? I like the Lord's response to that question. Pilate truly seems to be annoyed. Here I am trying to help you and you won't let me help you. You've got to talk to me. Don't you know the power I possess? Jesus continues to remain calm. And in verse 11, he gives this answer. He breaks his silence. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So there are two things that Jesus states. First, the authority Pilate had, he didn't get on his own. Oh yes, Rome may have given him some power and authority, but essentially he got his power from the Father. God is the one that instituted civil governments. God is the one that allows people to rule. That doesn't mean they, are, they can do whatever they want. They are still accountable for God, to God for what they do and for the decisions that they make. And certainly Pilate will be held accountable. So Jesus just simply points this out. If you hadn't been given authority from the Father, you wouldn't have any. Isn't this uh, kind of an admission that he did come from there? Maybe a tacit admission? The second point, the high priest has the greater sin if, in fact, Jesus is condemned, which he expects to be. Now, at this time, Pilate decided to release him. This is the fourth acquittal, verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. Now that gets them back to the charge they made originally, back in chapter 23 and verse 2, that he had been saying that he was a king. Jesus has already admitted that, but now comes on the part of the crowd, on the part of the leaders, political blackmail. Here's their argument. He made himself a king, even though he has admitted that to Pilate and said, my kingdom is not of this world. He came to be a king, all right, but not, not king uh, like Augustus Caesar, or anyone like that, but a spiritual king. However, here's the problem. By the time these charges are made and sorted out, Pilate would have probably already been removed from office. Just to make such a charge that somebody is uh, saying that he's a king and uh, a representative of the Roman government has not done anything about that, he could be removed first and questions might be asked later, if at all. The political climate was volatile and Pilate, the pragmatist, caved. Despite saying that he found no fault with Jesus, all those times, four acquittals, he decides 
Well, let's see what he decides. Verses 13 through 16. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. Acquitted four times, Jesus is now presented as their king, which probably makes them even madder than they already were, if possible. And they claim that their only king is Caesar. How hypocritical is that? They despised Caesar. They despised Rome. If Jesus had said he was going to fight them, they'd have been right behind him. But now they pretend that their only king is Caesar. Their new best friend and only king, Caesar of Rome, the one that they claim is uh, they're so uh, alleg uh, have such allegiance to, he's going to destroy the city of Jerusalem within 40 years. Matthew records that the people did a foolish thing. Going back to Matthew chapter 27, verses 24 and 25. Here's what happened. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. They were angry, and in their anger they foolishly spoke. They foolishly asked for his blood to be upon them and upon their children. And it would happen in 40 years. They would pay the price unless, of course, they repented. Those who genuinely repented would be free from what uh, they had said. But it's doubtful that any of the leaders of the people ever repented for what they said. Emotional decisions are rarely, if ever, good ones. Certainly not in this case. For them to ask for Jesus' blood to be, uh, to be upon their heads, that's one thing. But they offered up their children too. And their children would suffer. All of those who refused to become Christians would be in the city and the blood would literally flow through the streets of Jerusalem when vengeance was taken upon that city in A.D. 70. Pilate failed to do what was right, but the magnificence of Jesus shone brightly as he came forth victorious to be crucified. Let's consider what Peter wrote of all of this in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. <clears throat> for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin. 
nor was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Jesus had dignity as much as could be mustered considering how he had been treated. And he behaved and acted flawlessly during this hour of the power of darkness. If you're like most people, you have probably failed some tests and past others. But what is your plan for the future? We need to stand with Jesus. Even if it involves humiliation. Even if it involves being ridiculed and mocked. And there are plenty of people out there who are willing to do that. But are you going to stand with him? Or slowly walk away and trying to get out of the spotlight. We should be like him. We don't crave being mistreated, but if it happens, we're not going to back away from it either. We don't try to get people angry at us, but if it occurs, that's just the way it has to be. We're going to uphold the truths of God. Some people don't like hearing that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and that no man comes to the Father but through him. But that's the truth, John 14, 6. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Are we willing to absorb the criticism, the pain, maybe even the suffering that Jesus did. He did it for us. If you have never obeyed the gospel, I hope it is not because somebody might not be happy with it. You should repent of your sins if you believe and, of course, the evidence is abundant throughout the scriptures of who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us. And if you know that, you should repent of your sins, whether somebody wants you to or not. You should confess his name and not be ashamed of his name. You should be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. The only way you can have salvation is through the blood of Christ. And the only way you can contact the blood of Christ is in baptism. That's where God has put the blood of Christ to wash away all sins. And we know that because Revelation 1.5 says... Uh, that he washed us from our sins in his own blood, and because uh, Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22:16, and now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. It's the blood that washes them away in the act of baptism. I didn't set it up that way. God did. And you will hear undoubtedly many things from many people that say something totally different. But that's what the Bible says. That's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. That's what Saul of Tarsus was told. It's what's involved in every conversion in the New Testament. Repenting, confessing, being baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So while you are under the water, the blood will wash away 
your sins. And you can rise to walk in newness of life and then to live and stand with Jesus. If you need to respond to that invitation today, we invite you to come. If you already have, but you have not been standing firm, then repent of that and make sure that you're on the right track while we stand and while we sing.